today we have a discussion about the anatomy of the ear so as we know we can divide the ear for our convenience into three parts one is called as the external ear one is called as a middle ear one is called as the inner ear why it is called as external because it is something which we can visualize with our eye and with the help of some instruments and then there is the middle ear which is in between the external and the internal and this is the inner ear all right now each of these have parts and each of these have a specific function the external ear has 1 2 and 3 3 parts one is called as the pinna which is what we can see and then this is called as the external auditory canal it is external part of the external ear and this is the auditory canal that is it transmits sounds what it receives towards the membrane called as the tympanic membrane this tympanic membrane is a thick membrane which vibrates as the sound passes through it as the sounds pass through the ear and hit the tympanic membrane it vibrates and this vibrations in turn move the ear ossicles these ear ossicles are part of the middle ear so they mainly transmit the sound and amplify the sound this vibrations pass to the stapes and they are attached to a structure called as a oval window oval window is a structure on which the stapes foot plate sits and on this vibration the fluid in these canals move and from there the vib- this vibration is carried to the brain in form of electrical signals so here the inner ear acts as an electrical transducer wherein the sound energy is converted into a form of electrical energy and this goes to the cortex and it is understood by the wernicke's area in the cortex it goes to the temporal lobe from wernicke's area a speech is generated via input from wernicke's area to the broca's area so now we will discuss parts of each in the first part we will discuss about external ear so let's begin so this is first part we see is the pinna pinna this whole part is the pinna this pinna is completely made up of cartilage what kind of cartilage it is made up of yellow elastic cartilage so this bring us to a clinical point here so there are some uh, organisms that act on this or uh, this cartilage and cause inflammation and destruction the organism here is pseudomonas so you can remember as p for pseudomonas affects p for pinna so here you have the pinna and then and then it is continuous and ends at the lobule what is the importance of lobule lobule is devoid of any cartilage there is no cartilage in the lobule since there is no cartilage in the lobule so it is used for variety of purposes so it is used in obtaining a blood sample for infants since it is richly vascular and since it is also a relatively cool part of the eye lepra bacilli also tend to sit here so this makes it a region where we can also draw a slit skin smear we also take a slit skin smear from the external layer or the pinna slit skin smear for leprosy let's skin smear for leprosy 
all right so coming to the points this is the pinna and this part here is called as the helix the part opposite to the helix is called as anti helix this is called as the anti helix and then we have something called as tragus a part opposite to tragus is called as anti tragus and this part is called as concha concha there is a fossa that is created here this fossa is called as the scaphoid fossa why is it called as scaphoid fossa because it resembles that of a boat boat shaped fossa called as scaphoid fossa so now there are some very important points that come here this junction where the lobule joins the tragus here this junction is called as the incisura anywhere incisura is usually the junction between two significant points there is another clinical significance of incisura there is an incision called as lempert's incision lempert's incision lempert's incision is taken at the level of the level of incisura it involves the incisura and then tragal tenderness tragal tenderness is a sign of mastoiditis so coming to the external layer the pinna again so the pinna has the helix opposite to helix is the anti helix opposite to the anti helix we have here the tragus opposite the tragus we have the anti tragus and the junction where the lobule meets the tra tragus is called as the incisura clinically importance is the lempert's incision that we take while doing mastoiditis or mastoidectomy and then since pinna is made up of elastic cartilage pseudomonas organism can cause perichondritis or inflammation of the cartilage the lobule is a vasc is not having cartilage hence we draw blood samples from here slit skin smear for hansens can also be taken from the pinna since it is relatively cool part and lepra organisms need they grow well on a cold temperature this is about the importance of the external ear as far as the pinna goes now if we take the external auditory canal the external auditory canal has two parts it has a bony part and a cartilaginous part cartilaginous part and a bony part it is very evident in this diagram here so let us observe this diagram observe this diagram carefully here we see the external auditory canal that communicates with the pinna so pinna this is the external auditory canal here this is made up of multiple glands and the fat subcutaneous tissue this part is completely bone so initial part is cartilaginous the next part is bony and the angulation is like this it is initially the cartilaginous part is angled superiorly and the bony part is angled inferiorly so that is why to visualize the tympanic membrane we have to move it we have to move the pinna superiorly posteriorly and laterally superiorly and backwards superiorly backwards so this becomes straight once it becomes straight you are able to visualize the tympanic membrane here if you observe carefully the tympanic membrane makes an angle with the horizontal and this angle is about 55 degree now cartilaginous part is 1/3 bony part is 2/3 this cartilaginous part contains many hair follicles so since it contains many hair follicles folliculitis is commonly seen in the cartilaginous part of the 
anterior one third. In the bony part, the skin over the periosteum is very thin. So if at all there is any inflammation of the skin at the level of the bony part, it is very painful since it is the very thin skin underlying the periosteum. Now coming to another clinical significance of this. There is a gland here sitting right above. Which gland is it? Yes, this is called as the parotid gland. This is the parotid gland, a diamond shaped gland that is present. In some individuals there can be a communication via fissures. So these have a specific names. This is called as fissure of Santorini. This is called as fissure of Santorini. And this fissure is called as fissure of Hushk. So what is the clinical importance again? If at all there is any infection in the parotid or in the external auditory canal, it can be a two-way infection affecting both the parotid as well as the external auditory canal. This is about the external auditory canal. So summarizing the external auditory canal, the external auditory canal has outer one-third is divided into an outer one-third and inner two-third. Outer one-third is made up of cartilage, cartilaginous part and the entire length of the external auditory canal is 24. So one-third will be 8 and 16 millimeter. So once we know the skin is thinner here in the bony part so it is more painful. And then we have fissure of Santorini and fissure of Hushk that is present in the external auditory canal. That next brings us to the next part which is the tympanic membrane. Before that if there is something called as external auditory canal there should be something called as internal. So what is the internal auditory canal? Auditory canal is something related to hearing. Similarly there is one canal called as the internal auditory canal that is exactly here where the vestibulocochlear now passes through so that is called as the internal auditory canal along with there is also a seventh nerve that passes through there so we will discuss about it at some other point and now this tympanic membrane is called as tympanum so the part opposite to it is called as mesotympanum the part above it is called as epi is above below is called as hypotympanum so hypotympanum epitympanum and mesotympanum so these are the parts of the middle ear all right this is happening as the tympanic membrane oscillates the vibrations are carried through the middle ear so here this is a beautiful diagram that shows how the movement effects. So as this moves, the malleus and cousins tps move. So as they move, as the membrane moves anteriorly like this, this pushes the fluid and this pushes the fluid and it comes back this way. And this oscillates, the membrane oscillates and then as the tympanic membrane moves away this way, this also con constitutes the movement of fluid so there is constant movement of fluid that vibrates the membrane and constant electrical signals are generated so that is about the clinical significance so now as i told you there are some named incisions that are there in the ear surgeries there are three incisions one is called as the rosen incision that is endomiatal approach so once we open so the meatus within the meatus endomiatal approach this is called as a rosen sensation so once we take a speculum and pass through and reach somewhere near the tympanic membrane so once we reach somewhere near there what we do we give one incision that is 
vertical so imagine the patient is asleep like this so this is a seer so we take an incision we put a speculum inside and look then initially we give a vertical incision followed by a curvilinear incision so this will be at the 12 o'clock position this is the 6 o'clock position so we give another incision from here and from the tympanic membrane we maintain a gap of about 5 to 7 millimeter and then we give a curvilinear incision this is called as the rosen's incision or the rosen's approach endo endomedial approach and then there is end oral approach as i had told you the limpert's incision so this becomes the importance of incisura where the incision is extended so there is a curvilinear incision that is given so that is the limpert's incision here we see curvilinear incision between the tragus and the helical crest so that is somewhere where the incisura appears and then we enter inside and then we lift the meatal wall that is the limpert's incision and then we have another incision called as william wilde's incision or wilde's incision where if this is my pinna so this is posterior of my pinna posteriorly so i give an incision posteriorly this is called as the william wilde's incision so this is at the centimeter around 1 cm i maintain and i give an incision this is called as william wilde's incision all these incisions help you in entering the middle ear and working on the middle ear so coming to the last part left in the external ear that is the tympanic membrane very very important so angle made 55 degree so this is the tympanic membrane tympanic membrane specific points to remember derived from all three layers all three layers ectoderm mesoderm and then endoderm so to adhere this tympanic membrane we have something called as a annulus annulus is a bony covering that fits the tympanic membrane so in this tympanic membrane we have two parts one is called as a pars flaccida one is called as the pars tensa this is called as the pars tensa here pars tensa why is it named pars tensa because it is tense pars flaccida because it is flaccid or loose all right so this pars tensa has three layers so imagine this is the external auditory canal this is the tympanic membrane and this is the middle ear middle ear contains mucoid mucoid cells or some amount of mucus secretions so what happens so this will be the part of skin so the the three layers will be skin then there is a middle fibrous layer and then there is a inner mucoid layer or mucinous layer so that is the three layers and this fibrous layer why is it flaccid because the tough layer or the fibrous layer is absent in pars flaccida does not contain the fibrous layer hence it is flaccid and then as we saw we had three ear ossicles which were the malleus the incus and the stapes the malleus the incus and the stapes so here you can see the malleus the incus so the malleus so this malleus is present here so this is anterior imagine this is the ear so this is anterior this is posterior this is the anterior this is the posterior so this will be my anterior malleolar fold this is my posterior malleolar fold and then this is the handle of the malleus and this is another your ossicle called as incus so the tympanic membrane has other specific points that can be told with respect to tympanic membrane the tympanic membrane let's summarize we told you about the annulus of the tympanic membrane the surface area of tympanic membrane is 90 mm square but out of this only 55 mm square forms the effective surface area for hearing so this is the most efficient ear surface area why is this very important we will know when 
we talk about impedance matching there is a phenomenon called as impedance matching that happens for which this plays a very vital role the 55 value so we have pars flacida pars tensa absence of fibrous layer it is flaccid all three layers present pars tensa then this is the malleus so this is the anterior malleolar fold this is the posterior malleolar fold all right this is called as a cone of light cone of light cone of light it is present in the anterior inferior quadrant if we divide the tympanic membrane like this this is the anterior superior anterior inferior posterior superior posterior inferior so anterior inferior is the cone of light what is cone of light as the scope or an external light source is appeared it hits the the handle of the malleus and the reflection of that light forms the cone all right now here coming to a very important point again this part here is the epitympanum epitympanum so you see a malleus forms a part of it and then here there is a very 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 important structure here this is the neck of the this is the neck this is the neck this is the neck so there is a space formed by a part of the fold malleolar folds neck of the malleus in this epitympanic region that region is that space is called as prosac space prosac space what is the significance there is a phenomenon called as cholestitoma 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 also forms in the prosac space so that is why whenever we are doing surgeries to remove cholestitomas it is very important to explore these recesses and remove the cholestitoma to prevent recurrences so that is it about the external layer so the external layer let's summarize in 2 minutes all right so external layer has three parts the pinna the external auditory canal and the tympanic membrane the pinna is mainly made up of cartilage p4 pinna p4 pseudomonas perichondritis lobule used for blood pricks slits can smears are taken from here external auditory canal bony and cartilaginous parts fissure of santorini fissure of husky communications with the parotid and then we have the tympanic membrane making angle of 55 degree effective area is 55 mm square transmits the vibrations to the middle ear the ossicles and then they in turn transmitted to the cochlea so there here we saw the prosac space that is present the epitympanic space and then we have the muscle also present here that is tapedius we will talk about it in the middle ear video and then we saw about the inner ear we said there is the internal auditory canal if there is an external auditory canal there should be an internal auditory canal as well so that is bringing us to the end of external ear